Um, three, two, one. Welcome everybody to the Department of English and Creative Writing here at uh, Lancaster University. Uh, my pleasure to hand over in one second to two of my colleagues, uh, Oki Unzelo and Lindsay Moore. Uh, this event was uh, initially planned about a year ago, at which point we were planning an event back in 2020 autumn as part of Black History Month. And after many reincarnations, uh, this is where we are. So it's my pleasure right now then. And at that point, I, at that point, Oki was not when we first invited to do this, he wasn't a member of the department, but I'm very delighted to say that he is now. So I hand over to my two esteemed colleagues, uh, Oki and Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Um, so yeah, a warm welcome from Lancaster Woods, as we are sometimes known, um, to everyone here this evening, and particularly to our guest author, Oke Chukwu Nzalu, um, or OK, OK, as we can call him. Um, a quick word on format before we start. We're going to talk about OK's novel and hear a couple of excerpts from it for about 40 minutes total. And then we're going to open the discussion to the audience. As John's already said, if you could please um, keep your mics muted and your screens off until we get to the Q&A. Uh, when you're invited to use the raise hand function, the little hand button, um, and I'll bring you in um, on mic or even on camera if you want. And I can also feed in questions from the chat at that point if need be. So I'm really delighted um, to welcome OK, His debut novel, The Private Joys of Nena Maloney, was um, published by Dialogue Books in 2019. And the paperback came out late 2020. OK was born in Manchester and read English at Girton College, Cambridge. He's a writer high school teacher still, just about, and also our brand new colleague um, in the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster. So we consider ourselves very lucky. OK was the recipient of a New Writing North Award in 2015 that led to the publication of Nina Maloney. The novel then won the Betty Trask Award for the best first novel from a writer under 35. Congratulations, OK, on being so young and was shortlisted for several other awards, including the Polari uh, First Book Prize. Bernardine Evaristo, who we all have heard of, um, at the forefront of efforts to reclaim and reinvigorate a Black British literary canon, applauds this novel as smart, serious and entertaining. An apt summation, I think, of this bittersweet, diversely populated, amplified Bildungsroman. To give you a very brief summary before we start, uh, without spoilers, Nena is the daughter of Joni, a mostly ordinary white Briton, and Morris, which is not um, his first name, a Nigerian graduate and evangelical Christian, who fall in love in Cambridge in the early 90s. When we meet Nena as a young adult in Manchester in 2009, she's asking questions about the Igbo heritage bequeathed by a father she's never met, to a mother who refuses to discuss him. But Nena is not the only one seeking both a secure sense of self and a more expansive worldliness. Now, we're going to start um, with a reading from OK, um, and he's going to read for us from the beginning of the novel, where we readers meet Morris in a Bible study group in Cambridge in 1992. So over to you, OK, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much for that very kind introduction and for referring to me as young, which I will hold close to my heart for a very long time. Um, yeah, I'm going to read from the beginning of the novel. Um, so, yeah, it should be pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we can't use that quote, Joel, said Morris, trying not to lose his temper. He took a deep breath and wondered if he could eat a ginger snap without anyone noticing. Morris Nyamaka had finally given in and agreed to host a meeting for their newly formed but already turbulent evangelical group in his flat, which was a 15 minute cycle from the centre of Cambridge. It was 1992, two years since he'd graduated from university, and he saw fewer and fewer familiar faces with every passing day. When Morris first joined the group, he had thought it might be a good way to meet new people. The only drawback, he realised, was that he did not like the new people he had met. 
This was the third day of the third meeting, and it was threatening dangerously to spill over into a fourth. He welcomed the Bible study group into his pokey flat, which he refused to clean beforehand in case it made them feel like they were welcome to stay beyond the parameters of the study group. Parameters which he had now decided were strictly, even ascetically, ecclesiastical. He distributed own brand digestives and thin squash. He hid the good biscuits under the sink. Why can't we use it? said Joel. I think it's beautiful. Yes, said Morris, but but what? Joel Aberhart, whose voice had begun to take on a somewhat confrontational tone, was a Cambridge economics graduate who's rumoured to have turned down a six-figure starting salary to care for his ailing mother. Both salary and sciatica remained unverified, but he cultivated a trying air of martyrdom which had made more than one person at St Jude's think about breaking him on the wheel. And he chewed his biscuits with his mouth open. Listen, he said generously, for he is hated by the hypocrite and the miser, for the former is afraid of detection, for the latter refuses the charge, for he camels his back to bear the first notion of business, for he is good to think on if a man would express himself neatly, for he made a great figure in Egypt for his signal services. Can't you see how beautiful it is, he said. Well, said Morris, trying to be reasonable, it's very beautiful, but that isn't from the Bible, is it? It's from Jubilate Agno by Christopher Smart. Why did people always assume he didn't read? Was it because he was an engineer or because he was Nigerian or both? It's a nice poem, Joel, but he's talking about his cat. And what's wrong with that, Joel huffed? Well, there's nothing wrong with it, but this is supposed to be an extension of the Bible study group. The whole point of this was to get to know the Bible better by sharing it with others, to explore how we can spread the good news in a real world setting. The setting was to be Bertie's, a small independent cafe on Huntingdon Road, the route northwards out of the city. It was noticeably more popular with the locals than with your average Cambridge student, li liable to blanch at the prospect of a 15 minute walk in the city where everything was a stone's throw away. For Morris and the young men who accompanied him in baggy t-shirts and contrite expressions, the cafe was ideal because the clientele mostly consisted of working professionals who were usually too busy to respond to their, evang to their evangelism with lengthy arguments about the Big Bang and natural selection which academics brandished with such glee. These people were much easier. They simply frowned, accepted the postcards with biblical extracts written on them, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, said the picture of King's Collar Chapel. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight, said the River Cam. And they went back to their godless lives, perhaps somewhat inspired, perhaps not. While lawyers and estate agents and consultants spread thick cut marmalade on their toast, Morris and his friends spread the word of God. Morris, however, thought they might be laying it on a bit thick. Morris came from a devout family prayers at home each morning before school and two church services on Sundays. There was nothing in the Bible Morris hadn't already seen and heard many times, but surely even English people, even fair weather sit at the back English Anglicans, should have found it easy to pick a few quotations. Surely everyone knew the kind of thing that was called for. God is love. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through blah, blah, blah. But when one Sunday morning in their meeting after the service, Morris had first suggested these words, Joel had spoken up and complained in his plainty, weedy voice. These quotations had been done to death. The public was hungry for something fresher. Morris's selections from the book of Jeremiah simply weren't current. To Morris's horror, the idea of a public starved of fresh biblical exegesis caught the imagination of the study group like a Pentecostal fire. They raised their eyes heavenward and dreamed about atheists walking aimlessly around the city, crying out for obscure passages from Deuteronomy and Habakkuk. Morris tried to point out that the Bible had been around for thousands of years, and that the God of Abraham and of Isaac was not in the habit of leaking anything never before seen, that the word of God was old, and that it was the evangelist's job to make his message seem new. In Morris's view, the job was almost like that of a magician or a messiah to reveal the wondrous in the ordinary, to spin gold out of flax, even, he ventured, to turn water into wine. But nobody listened. Joel talked on, eyes sparkled, murmurs of assent sped through the room, and Morris was overruled by a crushing margin. But not today. Not today. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you. Um, 
So we should start with an important question. Uh, I'm asking for Andy Tate here. What are the biscuits that are hidden away? <laughs> In my head, those biscuits. So I actually really like ginger snaps. So Morris is kind of the reverse of me. I would I would have hidden the ginger snaps myself. Um, but nobody else seems to like them. Um, I think the the biscuits under the sink would have to be custard creams and chocolate bourbons. Okay, good yeah. choices both. Okay. Um, more seriously, even in these opening pages, okay, it's evident that ideological certainties, the straight path, if you like, clash with the complexities of individual identity formation. So can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to start here with this scene and these men? Yeah, I sort of, I wanted this. So this scene is the opening of a kind of farce that opens the novel in the prologue. And I wanted this to be, to sort of serve two functions. Um, the first is that I wanted um, to have this sort of sort of meet cute between Morris, um, who's Nana's father to be at this point, and um, jo Joni, who is Morris's mother to be, when they sort of meet. Um, and they're two very different people. And the part of the point what of the prologue was to sort of set up their personalities so that we know when they meet something quite momentous is happening. But I also wanted it to be a kind of um, soup that a lot of the other things came out of, like a kind of um, primordial soup out of which a lot of other characters were born. So um, they're sort of um, the environment which produces this chaotic Bible group also contains um, Jonathan, this black man who's struggling with his sexuality, who we meet much more later in the novel. Um, and out of that sort of um, embryonic sort of stage in life, I suppose, comes these come these characters who, as you say, are struggling with identity and senses a sense of belonging <clears throat> in sort of in sort of different ways. Um, and I, I was having a lot of fun with comedy and farce, but also I was having a lot of fun with the world of work. At the time when I wrote this novel, I was in my when I well, when I wrote bits of this novel, I was in my sort of early to mid twenties and just sort of coming into the world of adult work and sort of um meetings and administration and I just and it was a very it was a way for me to kind of have fun with um a lot of the procedures I suppose of the workplace um and at the same time I was also leaving behind the world of university and um thinking about you know what life me what it means to move on from that stage mm -hmm. so this sort of opening prologue was kind of the, the culmination of a lot of that Great. Yeah, you're very attentive in this opening scene to the sorts of fissures which run through this pretty tenuous, I mean, you call it chaotic community <laughs> of men. And in some respect, they sort of reminded me of the men and the lonely Londoners who kind of gather in these small, semi-secret places and really don't get on very well. But <laughs> it's kind of shelter in some ways, I think, a, a haven. Um, so these fissures which are running through this, this kind of provisional community, and also you're very attentive to what's not being said here, um, like the very noticeable frisson between two of the, the members of the group, Alistair and Jonathan, who's about to be introduced later on the same page. Um, Jonathan wants to quote Leviticus's injunction against the lying together of men. Um, Jonathan later becomes Nina's friend um, when she's a sort of young adult or, or late teen, whereas Morris disappears um, mostly after the prologue. So I was wondering what it is about Jonathan that makes for a compelling trajectory. You know, why do we follow him quite closely through the novel? And in related fashion, is it a risk to feature an absent black father? Those are really good questions. Um, I suppose I'll start with the first one. So Jonathan, as you say, in a sense, Jonathan takes sort of more of a paternal role um, than Morris does because Jonathan is present, whereas Morris is not. And Jonathan's sort of trajectory was a really difficult thing for me to grapple with. And I wrote and I rewrote this several times. And one of the things that changed a lot was the role of who Jonathan was and what and and what um, his trajectory was going to be. The you know it's a common um, conundrum I think when you're writing a queer story of what what happens in the end. Is it going to be a tragedy? Is essentially the question that a lot of writers I think have to grapple with. Do I want this character to die? Do I want them to have um, a happy ending? If so, what does a happy ending look like in a way that is convincing and satisfying without being saccharine? And I think that without giving away that. At the ending that I chose, I really wanted a story that 
focused on what it means to be a gay black man in Britain today in terms of the the lows and the the privations I suppose as well as the privacy and also the joys of it um and the and to, to be able to have fun with even the dark bits of it and to be able to bring Jonathan to a conclusion that he deserved I think is the best way to put it without giving it away um yeah. I wanted to tell a story that felt like it was Jonathan's own like it wasn't being dictated by um a sense that a gay a gay narrative a gay black narrative has to be a certain thing um i wanted to tell a story that felt like it did justice to the struggles that he'd been through while maintaining a sense of himself even when he moved on from things that were really difficult for him um so that is partly why the language of biblical literature sort of reverberates throughout the book even, no matter which character is being spoken of and with Morris as an absent black father, yeah, you're right. That's one of the that's you know that's one of the difficult things about this book is that um, there are lots of black stories that have been told. Um, there are lots of um, there is there is a richness to black literature that is very precious. But in terms of what hits the mainstream and what and what the mainstream is most aware of and most hospitable to, the that spectrum tends to narrow somewhat. So so that's why I think that's a very good question of the, that pressure to respond to the stereotype of what a black father is um, because it's such a strong stereotype and such a present one um, of you know um, was it going to be it's not it's very hard to ignore that kind of stereotype and to write and to write outside of it you know if you're writing a black father you're, there's a really strong feeling in the story that you're writing in response somehow to what a black father has been portrayed as and mm. typically you know is he am I, you're either going with the stereotype or you're fighting against it and I wanted to try and I wanted to try and free myself of that um I was primarily writing a story in my mind about a single mother um because that was the story that I had known I grew up with a single mom my mum was a single mom from the time I was about 14 so I knew I I knew I wanted to write about that and to sort of address that um, at the time when I was writing, when I was growing up, when I was about Nana's age. And even today, there's a lot of stigma around single motherhood in the way that there is not around single, around um, around fathers who, have, who are not in their children's lives, um, which is bizarre and misogynist and terrible in all sorts of ways. And I wanted to address that because I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I guess, address that balance without again without being saccharine and without being clawing and uh, clawing and unrealistic um and because and you know morris is present in this in the narrative but he's not present as a father for the vast majority of this book so for me it was not morris as morris as father wasn't really my focus in a way um it was much more a sense of what could have been and what was lost if that makes sense. I'm I'm trying to answer the question as well as I can without giving away too much of the story. Um, That's a really illuminating answer. And I mean, also without giving away too much, for different structural reasons, neither of those two male characters has what we might call epistemic closure here. You know, um, I I see what you mean about the the pressure to give gay characters a particular kind of ending, which is often tragic. Yeah. Um but yes, they both persist, these characters, in very different ways, I think, th through the, the novel. Um, we'll come back to the, the use of humour a little bit later, because that's, you know, a kind of key characteristic of, of how you portray all of, the, all of these characters, I think. Um, but as you, you yourself said, OK, Christianity persists in the novel, even though um, some of these men that we meet in the prologue, stop being Christians or, or or stop believing in God or at least stop attending church. Um, but Christianity persists notably through the biblical epigraphs that open each chapter. I was wondering where these came from. I mean, they could be taken from the postcards that the evangelicals leave on the cafe tables, or they could be taken from Nena's private diary. Um, as it is suggested a little bit later. So can you say anything about how these quotations work as sort of glue in the novel? Yeah, so um, as you say, the, each chapter opens with a quotation from the Bible. Um, and 
this was partly this was served a number of functions really i wanted it to be i deliberately left it quite ambiguous and that i wanted it to, to, to possibly be from either nana's diary which <clears throat> as you read you see that her diary is sort of com um is uh, comprised of biblical quotations as a way of writing in code essentially about her feelings about her life without her mother prying into things um <clears throat> or the the postcards um that um that i read about in the in the opening sort of extract where um the ev the evangelists in the bible group sort of send these sort of give these out to people in the city and i wanted this to be to serve those two functions because it was a sort of a way of linking Nena and her father that they're both sort of doing the same thing writing messages into a void um and that the and to sort of give that um to refer to the possibility that it might not be a void after all that they're writing into especially Morris the idea that he might actually reach Nena in some way which I won't go into, but, <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, there's, um, without spoiling it. Can I spoil it? Have most people who are here read it by now? Is that a fair no, thing to say? <laughs> no, not sure. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, there's a, there's um, this sort of the, the idea of the postcard as, um, as a message in a bottle mm -hmm. I really wanted to um, play with. And it was interesting for me as well, because I as well, you know, I grew up in the church myself and I have, t I have, um, I've left it now. I don't, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not a believer anymore. I'm not a Christian, but I still carry that language and with me in a number of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And it was good for me to sort of look back on that with a different I sort of almost like Joni does when she reads the Bible for the first time as somebody who has no intention of of you know joining any sort of church groups or, or attending church at all but she sort of looks and she sees God through sort of narrowed eyes and that was really a way f kind of what I was doing as well when I did my um, research into those biblical quotations I wanted to look at um, you know there are some quite there are some quotations which I've used quite earnestly but there's also a lot I think of playfulness there and a, a mischief which is quite fun for me to have the opportunity to do kind of without repercussions and feeling I was going to be struck by lightning or anything like that. <laughs> it's a great device because um, they serve all these different functions. I mean, sometimes it's a sort of thematic link to what is about to be shown. Sometimes it's an image that you kind of carry through the quotation to link the chapters up. I really like that. Um, and also we will have um, all probably noticed um, in the extract that you read that you start with a quotation about a quotation. It's quite, it's very talkative this this novel it's kind of full of voices i really like that and some of those are biblical voices or sort of and have biblical cadences um okay so yeah i mean they also sort of bring private and public together they sh they show how lives are shaped through these sometimes quite random encounters um, maybe the persistence of these foundational narratives in society, even when society is predominantly secular. They have all these different kinds of functions, I think. Um, but maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the movement between places, because after the prologue, after these opening scenes in Cambridge, we then meet Nana and her mother, Joni, on the way to a wedding 17 years later. Um, and at this wedding, they'll also run into Jonathan, who's one of them, the men from the prologue. So why did you structure this novel so that it moves back and forth through the whole novel um, between the early 90s and the late noughties and between Cambridge and Manchester, which I think are two cities that you know very well? Yeah, so I really wanted to write a novel which I felt I could write convincingly, which is why I set it in those two places. Um, and I think there's a lot of very interesting contrasts and comparisons I guess and similarities that you could draw between the two cities um I remember like I grew up in Manchester and it's a city I know you know it's a place I know best in the world um and Cambridge is very very different from Manchester um mm. and um going to Cambridge as an 18 year old was very interesting for me as somebody you know I grew up like I went to school in Russia for like uh, what 10 10 ish years and rush home for people who don't know manchester is it's a really diverse part of town um it's you know people of all um world religions and um, walks of life uh you know i went to school with all i'd met somebody from every major world religion by the time i was like nine or ten and that to me was just normal and then of course you go to cambridge which is not as diverse at all and the sort of the um the ramifications of that for me were a bit of a culture shock mm -hmm. and so it was very 
there was something cathartic and helpful for me to be able to write about the, those two, the sort of the differences there. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're both very magical places, but the magic works differently in Cambridge, I think, from how it works in Manchester. I think Manchester is much more, there's more difference in Manchester, which is which is which affects a lot of stuff just beyond itself. Um, it's it, it feels like a very different place. Cambridge is rarefied. Manchester is it's diverse and and vibrant in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of the writing backwards and forward through time, I wanted to write about. I want. I, I I wrote a story knowing that the characters were defined by their pasts in in part, not held back from not held back by their pasts indefinitely, but certainly linked to and defined by their pasts. So I wanted to write a story in which it wasn't simply a case that one element of each character was explained by a single flashback. It was more. I wanted to write about the persistence of um, echoes from their pasts and to sort of I, I also sort of wanted to set up a mystery between Joni and Morris um, and having their sort of very promising first meeting and of course a child that they later had and I wanted to kind of untangle the the chaos of what happened between them step by step I wanted to give their story just as much room in a way as Nena's story um, mm -hmm with the idea i suppose that they're all kind of joined yeah great um can we hear a little then about nina's life in manchester yeah so i'm going to read um from the sort of middle of the novel um with um nena at this point in the story is working in a takeaway um she's got a part-time job there she's about she's about to turn 17 um and her mum is and, she, and um, she's just finishing her shift and her mum's going to pick her up and um there's earlier in the novel nena was sort of wandering around this in the city center and noticed a dress in a window that she worked that she thought was just fantastic and she had to have but then her mum sort of sent her text very abruptly and said you've been dawdling just come home um and um yeah i uh, i think that's all that needs to be explained there weren't many customers today. The busy periods and quiet periods were predictable sometimes. Football matches, weekend evenings, for example. And at other times, people seemed to come and go randomly. Tonight, there was only one old man, gingerly inspecting his dinner before shrugging and digging into it with a hungry abandon that made Nana blush and look away. Her mind wandered. It was nearly the end of her shift. Deep in Nana's heart was... Her mother, yes, but also a certain duotone midi dress that reached down to her knees. Oh, it was more than a dress. It was the way to somewhere new. Its sleeves were underground railways. Its structured bust pointed onwards and upwards. She had already begun to build a future on it. At first, she was only trying to justify the idea of spending the money she'd saved up from her job at the chicken co-op. But on the way home, Nana had thought about it more and more. By the time she realised she had unthinkingly forgiven her mother for sending a text which had, at the time, rankled deep in her soul, she knew she was serious about it. And so she should be. It was a serious dress. She hadn't tried it on, there hadn't been time, but she already knew there were things she could achieve wearing it. Great things. It was at precisely the right point between smart and casual, allowing her to articulate herself as sexy, fun, easygoing, but also quietly no nonsense. Whatever it was to be a woman after nearly 17 long years of being a girl, a new shapely silhouette might address it, might express it succinctly and with punch. This dress would strip her of all childish things and furnish her with a new, sleek, pared down self. This dress would usher in the dawn of a new era and high time. Already these last years before university felt wrong, like being called the wrong name or being held back a year in school. Nana knew she couldn't fast forward time, but could she pass up the opportunity for a preview? As Joni waited in the freezing cold car for Nana to come out of the takeaway, she replayed in her mind bits of her early relationship with Morris. Was she foolish? It had never been a joke to her, however wild it seemed now, for her to have had a child at 21. But the way things had turned out, she felt judged by her circumstances. She felt that her hopes, if not her entire self, had been made a joke of. Joni shook her head as if to clear her mind of a silly thought. She saw a figure walk quickly out of the takeaway and look around. Yes, it was Nana. 
Joni flashed her headlights and waved out of the window and Nana trotted across the road. Nana had her music in her ears at full volume. It was the Smiths and she congratulated herself once again on the aptness of the music. She had appropriated the Meet His Murder album as the soundtrack to her life. This charming man was catchier, but her mother had said that she liked it. And she told herself, although not in so many words, that it was made for her. She listened to it on repeat. Sometimes when she was walking alone, she pretended she was in a gritty low budget movie about her life and that the music was underscoring her every move while an invisible audience watched awestruck by her beauty and her sheer significance, although these things were worn so lightly, so carelessly, that you probably wouldn't notice them if someone hadn't made a film about her and underscored it with the Smiths. Joni quickly wound up her window and commanded her face to betray no reaction to the smell. Nana had worked at the takeaway part-time for most of the summer, and Joni was starting to get good at pretending. She held her facial expression fast and tried to busy herself with minutiae about the car to give the impression that she had other things on her mind. Before, air fresheners used to hang in thick, accusatory bunches on the rear view mirror, while Joni made tiny explosive comments about the smell and suggested that Nana's personal hygiene might be partly to blame. Joni tried to ignore it now. Even as autumn was rolling in, even when as now it was very cold, she rounded down her windows as far as they would go, which varied according to the car's mood until she saw Nana coming out of the building. She wound up the windows when Nana arrived because not to do so would hurt Nana's feelings, but she convinced herself that the smell wasn't as bad as if she'd given the car, wasn't this, sorry, she convinced herself that the smell wasn't as bad if she'd given the car a good airing first. For her part, Nana only plonked herself down on the back seat of the car and said thanks, with her earphones still in. For picking her up, Johnny was never ever late, and for not wanting to hurt her feelings, which were always out in the open. Nana knew why the car was cold. Love can be such a tiny thing. Neither of them even noticed it as they sat silently in the car, smelling of unholy meats and vowing to have a wash, a really good scrub at home. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, this, given what you've just read to us, this is probably a good time to ask you about um, the perspectives that you inhabit here. Um, questions about sort of the self and and um, representing other kinds of identities. Um, as I mentioned to you before we got together today, Sadie Smith has talked about her long standing standing tendency to inhabit multiple viewpoints, as you do here, sort of moving between the two perspectives. Um, to quote Zadie, she says, feeling with characters for them, alongside them and through them, extrapolating from my own emotions, which she sees as quite minor, but have these kinds of universal resonances. Does that resonate with you, Oki? Is that something you're trying to do is kind of inhabit these other potential selves, all these people who are quite different from yourself? Yeah, definitely. Um, I love Zadie Smith so much. Um, I love her writing and White Teeth, and as you probably can tell just from listening to that extract, was something that was a huge inspiration for me um, because I hadn't realised until I read that book that you could write about Britain, about the multicultural aspects of Britain in any way that you wanted to. She does this wonderful thing where she combines um, you know, that kind of um, the, the kind of the organised chaos of Salman Rushdie with the sense of humour of sort of, sort of Nick Hornby and, and David Nichols and that sort of British tradition of humour. And she writes about the Britain that she knows. And mm -hmm. I don't think I'd realised before I read that book that you could do that. Um, so for me, it was reading White Teeth was a huge sort of permission moment that we might just talk about. And um, I'll never forget that. And I think you're right. The way that she talks about inhabiting different characters, for me, it was something I had to kind of scale back <laughs> and try to do a little bit less. Um, one of the um, things that I encountered when I was editing this book was that I, I had to think about how many characters do I really want to have in this novel um, and as full as and as full of voices as it is now it was even fuller before before it met, it met this sort of editing process and mm -hmm. I think that's just because of the the life I've had you know that I grew up with I was always you know I grew up with all sorts of people and you know I went to school with all sorts of people so it, it felt natural to me to want to write a world that I recognised and doing that meant having lots of different types of people from lots of different backgrounds um, and so I sort of had to pare that down. Um, I was very naturally curious about what it's like to be different from myself um, but I think 
the one of the interesting things about the discipline I guess I learned from writing from the editing process was that <clears throat> you are at the end of the day making a book that needs to be comprehensible and satisfying and feel like a co co cohesive whole um yeah. so I had to sort of pare that down yeah that's really interesting because I was thinking about where where would I put this novel on my bookshelves and my I'm kind of leaning towards somewhere between Hanif Qureshi's Buddha of Suburbia and Zadie Smith's White Teeth. I mean, for me, White Teeth was was I could kind of feel it in the background as I was reading this. And that's partly because of the generosity, I think, of the, the kind of these multiple perspectives and the the warmth of these characters. Um, and also because it's really funny. Um, and my kind of alignment of your novel with those other two makes me wonder whether um comedy is a particular first novel thing you know <laughs> i mean zadie and and certainly hanif Qureshi have been a little less funny in their subsequent work so hopefully you'll maintain your humor um but i was going to ask you a little bit about comedy because you've written elsewhere about wanting to confront and presumably make readers confront the issue of mental illness and isolation in queer men of colour through comedy as one way in which to broaden vocabularies for thinking about gender, sexuality and ethnicity. Um, and like I said, the humour in this novel feels very warm, it feels very inclusive, it's kind of gentle and quite broad in some ways, it's inclusive I think. Um, it can also be a way of unveiling difficult secrets or, or buried stories here. So can you tell us something about your use of humour to confront pretty difficult issues that these characters are negotiating? Homophobia, racism, even suicide. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. It was um, kind of a mission, I think, that I had, certainly with um, Jonathan's um, journey through um, feelings of isolation, <clears throat> feelings of... Um, sort of low self-esteem and his experiences um, uh, dating a, um, a white man who is less than generous of spirit. Um, I, you know, I think that um, we are in a moment right now where we are moving towards a better world in terms of the diversity of Oops. Okay, it's frozen here. Yes, um, I'll send him a text. Am I, am I still frozen? Am I still frozen? About now. Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ugh, sorry. Um, where did I? What did I? What was that? What had I cut off and saying? Should I just start from the beginning? We were moving into a world that I think was yeah. Was, I see. Was, mm. Yeah, so yeah, so we are moving into a world, we're seeing some positive changes, among which is the publisher that I am with, Dialogue Books, which is, you know, really actively and explicitly promoting um, publishing stories of people by marginalised, by writers from marginalised communities, and I think that's very important. But at the same time, we're still not there, and I think there are a lot of stories that are, when they are heard, are heard not from the voices of people who have lived them. You know, I think that um, one of the things that I was trying to do with this story was to give Jonathan his own story on his own terms. Um, I wanted him to be telling a story not of white guilt, but of the, the black queer pain that he experiences. I didn't want this to be a story about <clears throat> what it feels like to be a white person who has made mistakes. I didn't want it to be just that story. I wanted it to be a story of the real pain, I wanted it to be a story in which it was impossible to look away from what Jonathan had experienced, which is why a lot of the stories that, a lot of the glimpses that we get of Jonathan's stories are monologues from his perspective. So we only hear his side of a phone call or we only hear his side of the conversation. Um, and the humour that I brought into that was partly to sort of lighten it because they are very, there's, there's some really dark elements to Jonathan's story. He experiences the some of the lowest things that you really can experience as a human being. But also I think that it was a way of sort of foreshadowing the light at the end of the tunnel for him. I think that the humour uh, hints to the reader that um, about what kind of story this is going to be, which can be a bit of a trap with um, comedy writing, I think, because I think humour sort of hints to the reader that uh, because comedy requires such quite careful organisational thought, if it's going to be successful, it can hint to the reader that things are going to be tied up more neatly, perhaps, than they really than they really should be, or they really are. But for Jonathan's story, I wanted the humour to foreshadow 
<clears throat> and a glimmer of hope and um, the idea that he he would at some point be able to look back on what he has experienced and laugh um mm. and i wanted there to be a kind of generosity towards him because uh, as well as jonathan being mistreated by the man that he is in inverted commas dating mm. jonathan is uh, one might say that he's allowing himself to be treated a certain way quite terribly mm. and i wanted there to be a warmth to that to a warmth to the examination of that and a, and a sort of a sense of forgiveness and an understanding rather than kind of bleak critical extermination great um i've got one more question for you okay and then i'm going to open it up to the floor because i'm sure our audience is chafing to jump in and ask questions um but something that's very important for nena is her ebo language study and this is something which is very much in process um at, at the end of the novel it's crucial to integrating this heritage that she knows very little about so she's having to kind of approach it um in the in a general sense rather than through her you know the family narrative part of which she's missing um and i noticed in an earlier interview that you have a framed picture of an achebe book cover i think it is on on your wall so i was wondering how important are nigerian writers or writers of nigerian heritage to you yeah they really are um i encountered um things fall apart which is now on my wall um first when i was about 10 9 or 10 years old um and i say encountered rather than read deliberately because um in a very unusual move for a for a conservative nigerian nigerian parent my dad said to me you want to be a writer well you need to read this um which i think it must be one of the very rare <clears throat> instances documented of a nigerian parent encouraging their child to do anything that isn't medicine um <laughs> but um i was i i could i i, I thought okay I, I need to read this and I tried to read it and I just couldn't comprehend it at all mm. um certainly I couldn't really understand what it was trying to do um and so I sort of set it aside and I kept trying to read it every few years and not quite getting it until I, and I didn't actually read it until I was about 22 mm. um and and then suddenly it was this huge awakening I guess um and before that I'd read Shimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Purple Hibiscus and then the, and that sort of started I guess a journey of oh my goodness, there are other people doing what I want to do much better than how I'm doing it. So um, that sort of journey, I suppose, of figuring out how other people had done what I want to do in very, very different ways mm. was really important to me. Um, and I love that Chinua Chebri has this um, he has this generosity even though stylistically I think we're very, very different. Mm. I really wanted to emulate his generosity of um, spirit and his understanding of very difficult how very different distant things can relate he's very even-minded i think about colonialism perhaps too even-minded mm -hmm. um but um i wanted to sort of emulate that kind of patience of spirit that he has i really think that's wonderful and so important um i um i found it so profoundly freeing to know that I could write about my culture. Mm. I, you know that you can do things sometimes cognitively, but to, to feel it, I think, is a very different thing once you've seen it in front of you. And there's this whole other incredibly rich canon of writing, right? So you kind exactly. of draw from multiple sources. Yeah. yeah. Great. So we're going to open it up then. Um, if anybody has a question, I'm sure you do. Um, if you can put the use the raise hand function, if I can see that, um, or drop it into the chat. Oh, Sharon's got a question here already. Um, question for OK, Sharon asks, how important was the new Writing North Award to your development as a writer? Oh, that was, yeah, that was really, really important. Um, new Writing North, for people who maybe aren't familiar with them, they're a fantastic writing agency that helps and supports writers who are based in, nor in the north of England. And they... They really helped me, um, partly just because it was a financial award and I got some money and I was a trainee teacher at the time and money was really important to me, but also because they they really championed in my novel and really believed in my work in a way that I hadn't really experienced before. Um, they 
you know, they encouraged me. Um, Claire Malcolm, their CEO, was so encouraging and and just really believed in me in a way that I think I really needed. But also they gave me some really important practical help. They introduced me to the woman who's now my agent. They sent my manuscripts to Charmaine Lovegrove, who is now my publisher. Um, so without that award, I might, you know, I, I wouldn't, I might not be here. So. Great. Well done then, you're writing north. Yeah. Any other questions from people? Um, Andy, I think that's you. Yes. Do you want to put your camera and your mic on, Andy, then? Oh, Hi, okay. okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, really wonderful evening and, and uh, fantastic reading and, and great questions, Lindsay. Um, just a question about your, your use of, of biblical allusion. Um, when I'm not thinking about biscuits, I'm thinking about biblical allusion. And um, I'm just really intrigued by your use of it as a kind of structuring device. It sort of punctuates the narrative. Did, did you have any sense um, of trepidation alongside the mischief, that word of mischief that you use? Um, as somebody who comes from a background where belief was obviously very important and that's something you've you've left behind, but it's clearly in one way or another kind of important to you. So is it is it is it a challenge as well as something that can be kind of enabling or useful as a writer? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that even though, as I say, I, don't, I no longer believe in God, um, having grown up with that and having grown up with you know, taking my belief in God very, very seriously, I think it's hard to entirely leave behind all sense of sort of reverence for something like that. And also more than that, for me, it's a sense that I know how much it means to other people. Um, Christianity is such a big word. There are so many different kinds of belief in it and so many approaches to that kind of belief and some of them are very generous and and, and which um, so many there are types of belief and experiences with Christianity which engender a lot of respect from me personally and types which I've, I've, of which I'm quite dismissive and critical but, um, but I was aware that there are good people who value the that sort of literature that I was playing with so I did want to be I did want to give myself the freedom to be playful and to to make certain points, but I didn't want to be dismissive of things that were un, that it was unfair to be dismissive of. So I was trying to tread that line. Does that answer your question, Andy? Yeah, it absolutely does. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a question from Alan. Hi, Alan. Um, Alan asks, uh, you said that writing comedy requires organisational thought. I thought somebody would pick up on that. Um, I wonder if you can say more about what you mean, Alan says, um, and any other advice on writing comedy? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, that, yeah, that's a good question. It is, I think, um, I think there's something about comedy, especially because in the first, I mean, there are two sorts of ways, I suppose, in which it requires organisational thought. In the first sense, just practically speaking, if you're going to write a farce like I did with the first prologue where a bunch of characters are sort of thrown together and it's kind of chaotic but then something quite nice happens at the end out of that chaos you kind of need to keep an eye on what's happening in the present and also what's going to happen in the future and how those two things are going to link so I suppose that's one practical thing but also comedy I think can be kind of an unwieldy thing to, to work with in that you can find yourself being cold or or, or mean-spirited <clears throat> or, or punching down if you're not careful and I really wanted to to, to 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 prevent the book from turning down that road so whenever I was writing you know one joke I had to think about how it connected to all the other things that the book was trying to espouse I couldn't simply I didn't want to have a kind of novel in which you know yes I wanted to write about two women Nana and her mother but I didn't want to have a kind of hand that to Jane Fairfax kind of like dismissal of all women or female friendships and sort of that kind of narrow perspective of it so um I, I, yeah that's what I mean by that sort of organizational mind I wanted to keep an eye on the big picture mm -hmm. and so so in terms of using comedy I think was your question about using comedy uh, as a writer and sort of advice for that was, do I have that right? Helen do you want to come in? Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know if my microphone's working, so I've turned it on. Um, yeah, I just, um, uh, anywhere that you wanted to take that question, really, is of interest to me because um, 
I love reading comedy, but it's quite intimidating to try and be funny on the page when you can't kind of practice your jokes in front of people in the way that you would with a stand up show. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, that is difficult, isn't it? And I think um, I did. So I actually sort of did do a sort of mixture of, I guess, stand up and practicing this book. I went to this open mic night um, in Manchester um, when I was still writing this and I um, just read an extract to it. Um, as you know, people are reading extracts from their works. So I read an extract, and it's quite nice to see what jokes, not even to see what jokes people refer to, but to get there was a, there was a way in which I could only fully get a sense of what I thought was funny once I'd seen other people to react to it. Um, it was very it was much easier for me to get a sense of the 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 the, the track I wanted to be on once I'd said the words out loud to an audience in front of me. It, um, not, almost irrespective of how they responded um i was paying attention to what bits people laughed at but it was it was about for me what kind of humor do i want to use and how does it feel to me to tell these jokes and i think that's really important because for my just from my own experience which was writing this one book it was very much you, you know that's you're right it's writing comedy in a novel is not the same as even writing it in for theatre you can't rely on an audience that you're ever going to necessarily see to respond in time to the work that you've written um it really has to be a sense of what you are trying to achieve first and foremost you almost have to forget about the reader although you ever i don't think you ever should or can but I, you almost have to forget about the reader i found it helpful to think what kind of and to rely on myself, I guess, I suppose, and to think if I'm laughing at this and, and this feels warm to me and it feels tender, then I then that's that's then I'm happy with it. Perhaps also if it feels contemporary, because I mean, in relation to these questions about moving across time periods and moving across different registers, I think, of, of language and also kind of tonal registers between comedy and tragedy. Um, I was wondering about also about how you what how you manage narrative voice. Um, because there's an interesting tension in the filtering of the 90s sort of through a contemporary vocabulary, like Jonathan worrying that his frothy latte drinking might compromise his heteronormative credentials. So I could sort of, you must have made a decision about, you know, how up to date am I going to be in the vocabulary that I use to sort of, that these these characters used to think about themselves yeah that was definitely um a decision i had to make i guess um with a lot of the characters the, the teenagers i sort of had to think how much do i actually want to place their vocabulary in the sort of early 2000s and i thought i wanted it to i wanted to write in a way that 17 year olds in, the, in that day would have recognized but not necessarily what they would have spoken i didn't want it to feel dated but i wanted it to feel reasonably convincing so that's why i was thinking about things like um sort of the, the earliest kind of instant messaging things that that students were using that kids were using at that time which are very different from um mm -hmm. what we use today i doubt that anybody who's on like TikTok or like snapchat now would even know what msn messenger was um but that i wanted to use something which kind of translated back and forth in time. Mm -hmm. You're giving us a good sense of how very difficult it is to write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have a question for OK? Uh, we've got a question from Faith. Would you like to come in, Faith? Is it Faith or Chinwindu? Would you like to put your mic on? Yeah. Is it Faith or Chimwendu? Yes. Chimwendu. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, like, see, um, it's actually an in I'm using. <laughs> I'm using an account that doesn't belong to me. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Whatever yeah. it takes. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for uh, the reading and the analysis. And uh, lastly, thank you very much for the questions because they open up the text more, especially uh, those of us who have not read it. I just uh, placed my own order this evening. Yeah. So, yeah, we're talking about, uh, okay, you're talking about uh, comedy. And um, it just occurred to me that uh, in the Nigerian literary tradition, uh, it's very difficult to see 
a, a work, a novel, for instance, that that uh, uh, makes a very clean, um, emerges very uh, in a very clean way uh, as as comedy. You know, there are there are there are scenes where you have um, comic scenes and uh, things that could could draw laughter and things like that. We see more of comedy in in drama more than in in the novel. So I was wondering um, if um, uh, there's any way if you you see yourself you know link into any tradition uh, in the past, so to say, in the Nigerian literary tradition, or if you if you see yourself uh, creating something that um, uh, or not, something that is not quite new, something that's quite new uh, in that regard. And again, uh, is there any way, or have you thought about uh, how your work could be could get into uh, you know, get into into the reading the readership of Nigerians because it's it's usually very difficult. You know, uh, publishing in the in the UK or, or Europe, and before the work gets get to Nigeria, it takes lots of time, and sometimes you have uh, pirated copies all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, gosh, yeah. Thank you for those questions. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You're right. You you have a point about comedy. I think Nigerians can do comedy. I think that's definitely true that Nigerians can do comedy, um, and, I, and, and I'm certainly not the first. But <clears throat> my inspirations and my sort of, I guess, the, the godparents of this book were not, in terms of the comedy, Nigerian. I was definitely consciously emulating a, a, a British feel of comedy, um, like the Zadie Smith, Nick Hornby sort of tradition that I referred to earlier. That was what I wanted to do. And that was partly because I was also trying to write about, I was trying to write in a voice that was born in the place that I was born. So because I was born here <clears throat> and I've grown up here, it felt natural to me to write in that way and to sort of, to. Not, necessarily, not even necessarily to emulate, but to nod to the writers that I'd read that were writing about this place. I was, I've was i always been very conscious of wanting to write about British Nigerian life in Britain. Um, I've never lived in Nigeria. I've been to Nigeria, of course, but I've never lived there and I wasn't born there and that's not where my life is. So I was very conscious of wanting to to write according to what feels authentic to me. Yeah. Um, in terms of, and your other question was very interesting. And you know, I think every writer is trying to. Every writer wants to do something new, um, but I don't think that I could have written this book had I not read other Nigerian authors before. If I hadn't read Shoyinka and um, uh, Chebe, and you know, if I hadn't read those, if I hadn't read other Nigerian authors, I think I'd be quite stuck in terms of how to grapple with the questions that the, the novel is grappling with. You know, Morris is trying to figure out like Nena, what it means to be a good black person in, in Britain. How much do you have to know? What kind of, how often do you have to put on a smiley face when things are going terribly? Um, those questions have been grappled with in various different ways by lots of different writers before me. And I couldn't really have written this novel had I not had access to that, which I think is a big question in itself as Nena realises, you know, it's one thing to <clears throat> be academically brilliant as she is, depending on the resources that you have access to but what happens when you don't have access to those in an immediate way in front of you in school and then it has to go out of her way and spend money that she saved up in order to um excuse me in order to learn simply to have a connection with her culture um and i think in different ways that's a different that's quite a problem for for lots of people um today in britain so um i think i'm definitely trying to do something new I just I'm not sure how much credit I can take for it. Um, my book is is published in theory worldwide, but obviously depending on context, it can be quite difficult to get it into different places. I'm I'm a, I've been in contact with bookshops in Nigeria though, so I'm aware that Roving Heights has it in Lagos. Outside of Lagos, um, I'm not sure, but I know that there's one or two bookshops in Lagos that definitely have it. So hopefully that will that will help. I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, sure. That's fine. Thank you very but, much. Yeah. Thank you. I think we could probably continue speaking with you for hours, okay, but unfortunately it is 29 minutes past, so this is the book. It's a beauty. Please order it and read it if you haven't already. I've just finished it for the second time, actually, and I liked, loved it the first time, but I really got kind of totally engrossed in it the second time, so 